Hi guys, uh, Pastor Greg Corcoran here from Battlefield Baptist Church. I uh, pray that this sermon is a blessing, an encouragement, and a challenge to you in your walk with the Lord. Additionally, I just wanted to say that if we here at Battlefield can ever be a blessing to you, please don't hesitate to contact us. And the best way to do that is through our website at battlefieldbaptist.org. Again, I pray this sermon blesses you, encourages you, and uh, that you'll fall more in love with God, more in love with His Word, and more in love with people. Well, praise the Lord. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be in the Lord's house. And again, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, I do as, as you... Uh, it, listen, today's going to force us to do something. Either you're going to have to pull out the app or pull out one of those pew Bibles if you didn't bring a Bible. Uh, no cheating today, right? Uh, you're like, oh, he's going to throw up the verses for us. And so, no, you're going to have to, you're going to have to dig deep. Uh, I will tell you, uh, if you want to go ahead, I'll give you a head start. If you turn, uh, to Daniel, the book of Daniel chapter one, page 574. Now, I don't know if it'll work for you, but it works for me. Okay. <clears throat> As you're turning, uh, this morning, I do want to, uh, uh, thank everybody also. In fact, uh, Miss Cini wanted me to thank everybody for all of the love and the prayers and uh, the food that was brought to her recently with the passing of her son, Bobby. And um, we were able to go and be there for his homegoing services uh, this past Tuesday. And so uh, I know that she is very, very thankful for the love that you've shown. And uh, she reminded me that uh, Jesus is still alive. Amen. He is still he is still on his throne and working in this place. The miracle worker, the way maker, the promise keeper. And so um, thank you, Sini, for those kind words. And uh, thank you to all of you who uh, prepared meals and took those to her. Well, what a blessing it's been to honor our graduates this morning. And uh, it seems just like yesterday that I was graduating from high school. Why are you laughing? <laughs> I had white hair at the age of 17. No, uh, it seems like I was just graduating yesterday uh, from high school. And then uh, about six months later, I won't go into all the details. Some of you know the background story. I had a number of uh, full scholarships to go to school for music and uh, never made it. Never made it to those colleges or universities and... Uh, I thought my life was going to uh, be that of a musical professional, a musical performer, and that I would continue to get postgraduate degrees, and then one day I might settle down and, and become a professor or a teacher of music, and uh, so that's why I have a fond love of music, all of music, and, uh, and so, uh, in fact, you can, you can uh, probably tell if you hang around me for a little while, you would probably say, what kind of music does he really like? I like it all. And I uh, really enjoy, uh, in fact, when I was in high school, I played a lot of jazz. And I uh, played uh, jazz trombone and, and some other things. And, uh, and yeah, all right. Uh, but it was a mere six months later that I would head out to the University of Paris Island, South Carolina. <laughs> Where's my man, Sergey? Just keep grunting away. Don't worry about him. And uh, made my way to Paris Island and all that Uncle Sam had in store for me. And uh, I can tell you that it's been a journey. Hadn't it, babe? It's been a journey. And I can tell you also that if I had known then what I know now, I could have probably saved myself from a lot of heartache and a lot of headaches. Anybody else feel that way? Been there, done that, wrote a novel on it. But through it all, as that song says, I learned to trust in Jesus. And through it all, I learned to trust in God. And you know what? Another thing that I learned to do in my life, I started to learn that I could depend upon the Word of God. Amen. That when the world would let you down, that God's Word will never let you down. It is true. 100% through and through, from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21, as my predecessor used to boldly declare, it's not only contains truth, it is the truth. So as we begin our time in God's Word this morning, I said earlier that I wanted to share a couple of verses by pointing, a couple of verses with our graduates and also our adults, and I want to point all of us, 
I want to point all of us to a few things before we really get into Daniel chapter 1. And, and if you want to write these verses down, you can look at them later. I understand uh, the limitations that we have in-house today. But uh, I hope and pray that these verses will be helpful. And if you're a, a graduate here this morning, whether it be high school, trade school, bachelor's degree, master's degree, or maybe you've already attained those degrees of notoriety, I think it would be a help for you as well. And the first passage would come from Jeremiah chapter 1. In Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse number 4 and 5, I shared these verses the other day with the students at Fresta Valley Christian uh, School as I had the opportunity to preach their closing chapel for the year. And uh, they really dug deep uh, in the barrel to get me to go out there. And uh, I told him this. Here's what the Bible says. Jeremiah says this. He says in verse number 4, Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Graduate, listen to what God had to say to Jeremiah. He's saying the same thing to you this morning. Before I form, bef He said, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, and before thou came forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee and ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. And so what God was telling Jeremiah was, Listen, I got a plan, and I have a purpose for your life. Can I tell you, graduates, that God has a plan and a purpose for your life? If you'll listen to Him. You can listen to the world, or you can listen to what God has to say. But I can tell you, you can be assured that he has a plan that is perfect. He has a purpose that is perfect for you. Another verse that I give you is found in Joshua chapter 1. And you can look in all of Joshua chapter 1, but specifically for this uh, little fun fest of sharing a few verses with you before we get started, I would point you to verse number 9. Remember, Moses is dead, and Joshua's on the scene. He's, he's having to take over the helm, so to speak, as the leader. And here's what God tells him over and over again. He says, be strong and of a good courage. Why does God tell him three times? Because just like us, God was talking to one of his children. And see, children sometimes need to be taught over and over and over again. He said these words. He said, be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. In other words, wherever you go, young person, if you have Jesus, wherever you go, you can be assured that he's with you. He's not going to leave you. He's not going to forsake you. He's going to be with you. Why? Because he's got a plan and he's got a purpose for your life. Sir, you may be 65, 75, or 85. That's a good reminder for you today. God is with you whether you're 85 or 15. And the final verse that I want to share, this isn't even the message, man. The final verse comes from Jeremiah 29, verse number 11. And God says, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you. The word thoughts there literally means his skill, his intention, his plans and his purpose. God says, for I know the thoughts that I think. I know my skill, I know my plans, I know my ability, and I know my purpose for you. And here's what he says in verse number 11. He says that my thoughts, my intentions, my plans and purposes, he said they're thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. So in other words, what do we take from three very simple verses of Scripture? We can be assured this morning that God has a plan and a purpose for our lives, young person, please don't ever leave the Lord out of your plans. Because if you try to make your plans, I guarantee you, you're going to falter and fall. But if you allow God to make the plan in His time and in His way. See, I wanted everything when I was a young person right then. Give it to me now. Give it to me. Bum, 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 bum. And God said, you need to slow down. And then I slowed down so much that I really couldn't see what God was doing in my life. And the next thing I found myself with my head shaved at Paris Island, South Carolina, and God said, this is my plan. And I said, how can this be your plan? This cannot be your plan. And yet God was working. He was growing me. He was maturing me. He was bringing me to a place where I might become more submissive to Him and His Word and His will. And so... We can be assured not only does he have a plan and a purpose, not only will he go with us, but we can be assured that God has a future for us. He says, I have a plan. My thoughts, they're thoughts of peace 
to give you an expected end. I tell people all this, this all the time. I'm headed for heaven and I can't help it. That's good news. Because if it were up to me, I'd find a way to mess it up. Anybody identify with that comment? If it was left up to you, would you mess it up? I think all of us should be shaking our head yes. Now, let's get into the message this morning, all right? We've been talking about superheroes, and you would know if the screens were up that I'm going to be talking to you about superheroes, and here's the title today, Servants of the Most High God. Look with me in Daniel chapter 1. As we get into the message, it's important to note that at this time, Babylon has taken Israel captive, and... The king, he's a man by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. And uh, his plan is to pull out some of the best and the brightest young men from Israel for what you might consider retraining. He wants to retrain these young men out of Israel. And notice with me right away in verse number 1 and following. Chapter 1, Daniel chapter 1, 1 and following. The Bible says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. So in other words, Nebuchadnezzar wins the battle, the war, the siege, if you please. And part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God, little g. And he brought the vessels into the treasure uh, house of his God, again, little g. And the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and the king's seed and of the princes, children in whom there was no blemish, but well favored and skillful in wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding science, as such as had ability in them to stand. Now that word stand means to serve. As such that had ability to serve in the king's palace. Now watch the last phrase. And whom they might teach, in whom they might teach the learning in the tongue of the Chaldeans. Now to be sure, I believe that Nebuchadnezzar is trying to do something much more than just training these young men to learn the language and to learn the customs of serving the king. But we have to read on to see what is the plan. Notice verse number 5. It says, And the king appointed on them a daily provision of the king's meat, of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years. So we see that it's a three-year plan. And uh, to that end, therefore, that they might stand or serve before the king. And so this three-year plan is established to re-educate and to reprogram, watch, not only the diet but the culture and the way of thinking of these young boys that would come from Israel. They were picked out, the best of the best, the cream of the crop, so to speak. And Nebuchadnezzar's plan, he tells Ashpenaz, he sets it in order, and he says, here it is, put them on a new diet, start teaching them our culture, and start teaching them to think, watch this, the way we think. Look again, continue on. Verse number 6. Now among these were the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names. Now watch this. For he gave unto Daniel the name Belteshazzar, and to Hananiah of Shadrach, and to Mishael of Meshach, and to Azariah of Abednego. Verse number 8. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. And so the ultimate goal for these boys, folks, is more than just force assimilation into the ways and teachings of Babylon. The goal is to get these young men to conform to Babylonian thought process. Watch this. And also religious school of thought. He wants these boys to conform. You're going to conform. And so here's what we're going to do. We're going to put you on my diet. We're going to give you a heavy dose of our culture. And we're going to teach you what you need to know to survive in Babylonian culture. And so the whole idea is, conform, is, is conforming to this new way of thinking. In fact, uh, I would suggest that nothing's new. The goal of this world and the goal of the devil, young people... Moms, dads, grandpa and grandma, the, the goal, if you're not aware, if we've been asleep at the wheel for the last, whatever, 40 years, the goal of this world is to get us, watch this, to conform 
not to Jesus Christ, but to conform to what the world has to say. So what was happening in, in Babylon is still happening today in 2022, which is why we need to open up our eyes and be aware of these things. In fact, Paul warned the Romans of this very thing. Remember in Romans 12, 1, he says, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. This is what, this is what the culture seeks to do. By the way, in Romans 12 and verse number 1, the word world, be not conformed to this world, that word world actually speaks of a system or a philosophy of belief. You see, this world has a system and a philosophy of belief, and it wants to get our attention. And then after it gets our attention, it wants us to give way to what thus saith the Lord and to start to acquiesce and to the point where now we can't even figure out what a man or a woman is. What is going on in this country? What happened? This was taking place then, and it's taking place now. There's no doubt that these boys who had been taught to worship the one true God were being put into a position that they might begin to worship the false gods of the Babylonians. And you say, well, how do you know that? Because I see the full court presses on. Look at verse number 7. Again, it says they immediately changed their names. And I had this beautiful slide, and, and maybe we'll show it next week. I had this big graph for you. But I'm going to share with you what their names meant, okay? So Daniel's name actually means God is my judge. Now watch this. They give him a new name. His new name actually means Bel protects his life. Bel is actually the chief idol of the Chaldeans. So they give him a name after their chief idol. Then you got Hananiah. Hananiah's name means the Lord shows grace, but they give him a new name called Shadrach. See, we don't even know Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. When I, when I ask people, hey, who's Hananiah? They look at me like a calf looking at a new gate. But if I say, who's Shadrach? They immediately know. Watch. Hananiah's name means the Lord shows grace, but Shadrach means under the command of Aku. Aku was the moon god. He's the moon god. Uh, Mishael, actually his name means who is like God. His new name, uh, Meshach, is who is like, watch it again, Aku, the moon god. So see, they're supplanting their biblical godly names for something that is anti God. Now watch this. Uh, Azariah, his Hebrew word, the name means the Lord helps. The Lord helps. And his new name, Abednego, means the servant of Nebo. Not Nemo, but Nebo. Okay? For those who are Nebo, Nemo fans. And Nebo is the Babylonian god of wisdom. Now here's a fun fact for you. Daniel and Mishael, their names end with E-L. A fun fact to remember is the reasons their names were Daniel and Mishael, it's a reference to Elohim, E-L, the suffix E-L, Elohim. You got Hananiah and Azariah, the suffix of their names, Yah, E-I-A-H. It's, it's the ending suffix of Yah. It's a reference to, you ready? Yahweh. So what's going on in Babylon? They're saying, we're getting rid of Elohim. We're getting rid of Yahweh. Any thought to Yahweh or Elohim, it, it's gone. We're going to put you in a position where we don't even recognize you. We don't recognize your God in your name, and we don't recognize that name anymore. Interesting fun fact, Travis brought it up. Why, do, why does the rest of the book of Daniel refer to him most of the, part, most of the time as Daniel and not Belteshazzar? Well, that's a little fun fact. I'm sure, Ernie, you'll have fun all week trying to figure that one out, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's one of those questions. These names were changed as a way of forcing these young men to forget their God and to begin to worship the Babylonian gods. But look at verse number 8 again because I love what the Bible says. It says, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. In other words, Daniel says, not so fast. Yes, you can give us names. We're under your control. We're literally slaves in Babylon, but not so fast with this stuff with the king's meat. 
And so what he does, he makes a request for him and his Hebrew buddies not to participate in the king's diet. And so you know the rest of the story. They say, okay, we'll give you a 10-day grace period. You can have vegetables and water, but if it doesn't work out, there's going to be trouble. And so after the 10-day period, you read the next few verses, the 10-day period goes on, and then you see what takes place. Look down at verse number 19. In chapter 1, it says, And the king communed with them. That phrase there, communed with them, literally means that he quizzed these young Hebrew boys on all that they were being taught. And notice what it says. And it says, And among them all was found none. None were found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore they stood, in other words, they ministered and they served before the king. Verse number 20, And in all matters of wisdom and understanding the king inquired of them, he found them, my Bible says he found them ten times. Ten times better than all of the magicians and all of the astrologers that were in his realm. In other words, these young teenage graduates, so to speak, of the king's new course of study after just ten days. Not the three-year period, after just 10 days, he interviews them and he says, hold on, they're better than all the magicians. They're better than, they're better than all the astrologers in my realm. These are really, really bright young men. And so he takes a liking to these young men. Bottom line, listen, when we decide to live for God, I can assure you that God will bless it doesn't, mean, it doesn't mean you're going to have a Porsche, a, a Mercedes, or all these. That's not what I'm talking about. God will bless your life. He will use you in ways that you cannot even begin to imagine. In chapter 2, you know the story in chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar keeps dreaming dreams. And so he's troubled by the dreams. And so he calls all of the magicians, all of the astrologers, and all the sorcerers to come. He wants to know what the dreams are all about here in chapter 2. And and uh, what they're trying to teach him. But nobody, if you read the passage, we're not going to take time, but nobody can interpret the king's dreams. And so at this point, he's ready to kill all the wise men. And guess what? That includes now Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And so Daniel goes to, he goes to Arioch, who is the captain of the king's guard, and he says, hey, don't kill anybody. He says, I'll interpret the dream for the king. Now, what you need to know is before he actually made that brave move, he actually tells Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah to be praying that he's going to go do this, right? And so he takes a step of boldness. And then if you look in chapter 2 at verse number 27, in fact, um, notice what it says. It says, Daniel answered in the presence. He answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king hath demanded cannot the wise man the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers show unto the king. Look at verse 28. I'd say this is bold. In verse 28, he said, But there is a God in heaven that reveals secrets and makes known to, and will make known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Look at the boldness of, da of Daniel. And then you see, look, drop down to verse number 48. Because after God works, after God uses Daniel, the rest of the story is Daniel is used by God. Daniel interprets the dream. Ne Nebuchadnezzar is blown away. Look at verse number 48 here, chapter 2. It tells us that the king made Daniel a great man and gave him many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon, the chief of the governors over all the wise men of Babylon. Look at verse number 49. Daniel does not forget his friends. Watch what he does. Then Daniel requested of the king, and he set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel sat in the gate of the king. So very quickly, <laughs> these Hebrew boys who are taken as slaves to Babylon, they're, they're inserted into this three-year school of hard knocks, so to speak, of Nebuchadnezzar. In very short order, they're now running the thing. They're in charge. But can I tell you something? Young people, you may be recognized today as a graduate, and I have no doubt that tomorrow you will be leaders. But when you're recognized as a graduate or a leader, sir, ma'am, grandpa, grandma, don't, don't turn the channel because this involves you too. You may be recognized as a leader, but can I tell you, when that happens, people are always watching. 
People are watching your life. They're marking your words. If you're speaking words to tear people down, you're speaking words to do damage, you're speaking as if you're someone in authority over somebody's life, be very careful of the words you speak because people are watching you. Now, back to the story. Look at Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3, look at verse number 1. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits and the breadth of six cubits and he sat it upon the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather the princes, the governors, and the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, and even the county sheriffs. Look at that. And all the rulers of the province to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Look at verse number three as if to repeat uh, what was just said, he says for them to come, and then verse number three says that the princes, governors, captains, judges, treasurers, counselors, sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces, they actually came. It says they were gathered together unto the dedication of the image of Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up, and they stood before that image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So this is Nebuchadnezzar's deal. He decides to build this golden image, and he has it. Look at verse number four. Then a herald cried out, to you it is, what's the next word? Commanded. In other words, like I said last week, when people make commands, they're not options. They're not suggestions. It says, to you it is commanded. Here's the command. O people, nations, and languages. In other words, everyone's commanded. Nebuchadnezzar is now making a command across the board. Look at verse 5. That at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, that you fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Verse 6. And whoso falleth not down and worship shall the same hour be cast in the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Now, the danger here is you say, I already know this story. What else can I learn? Please don't do that. Please don't do that. The moment that you think you've learned everything from God's word is the moment you're going to take a tumble. You know, we set ourselves up for a fall many times, thinking we've arrived. I've, never, I've not arrived. I was, I was learning new things from Daniel chapter 1, 2, and 3 all week. So here's the deal. In chapter 2, Daniel's boldness is on display. By the time we get to chapter 3, his three Hebrew buddies, remember he requested the king in chapter 2, and now we got Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who are now also in positions of authority. And so guess what? Now not only are, is Daniel been on display, but now these three Hebrew buddies are on display. And number one, there's always somebody watching, and number two, they're faced with a decision. Because guess what? Remember what you were doing over there? You were on the 10-day diet. And God blessed. But what are you going to do now? What is it that you're going to do now? Are you going to follow the crowd? Because here it is. King Nebuchadnezzar sets up this 90 foot high, 9 foot wide, golden image. 90 feet in the air. It's like going out and standing in front of the steeple and looking up to the sky full of gold. He says, when the music starts, you bow down and you worship that golden image. And he says, if you don't do it, you're going to be thrown in the fiery furnace. The choice is clear. And I would, I would assert that the choice is clear today for us. These guys, their choice was they either go along with everyone else and they obey the order of King Nebuchadnezzar or they don't. And here's the rub. If they, if they uh, obey the king, then guess what? At the same time they obey the king, they have to disobey God. Who said... You worship me and me alone. I think about what Joshua, you remember Joshua, what he said in his farewell address. And Joshua in his farewell address, he's talking to the people in Joshua chapter 24 and verse 15. He gets down to verse number 15 and he says, hey, if, if you guys think it's evil, if you think it's a problem, if you think it's a bad thing to serve the Lord, then you go ahead and make a choice who you're going to serve. But you remember what Joshua said. He, this is farewell address. He's going off scene. In fact, only a few short verses later, we find that Joshua dies. But you know what he said? But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they have a choice to make. Are you going to bow down 
Are you going to worship the golden image? And the reality, the, honestly, the question that they were faced with is the same one that we have to answer. The question is, who do we serve? Do we obey God or do we follow the crowd? I'm guessing it's going to get real quiet. Do we obey God or do we follow the crowd? Do we obey God or do we do our own thing? And I can assure you, let me just encourage you, if you're doing life, if you're doing life without having a relationship with Jesus Christ, as lovingly as I can say, you're simply doing your own thing. That's not a popular message in 2022. And I'm saying it because I love you and I care about you and I want you to know the same Jesus that I know because he died for my sins. He did something that I couldn't do for myself. And he gave it as a free gift if I'll accept it. But if, I'm, if, if you're here, you're watching, or you watch this message later on, and you're doing a life, quote unquote, without Jesus, then you can be assured you're doing your own things. And I can assure you that's not God's plan. Remember I shared with you God has a plan and a purpose for your life? That's not his plan. Doing life without God is not his plan. He's made it abundantly clear what his plan is. But in order to realize God's plan... We have to understand that all of sin and come short of the glory of God, the Bible says in Romans 3.23. And there's a payment, there's a wage for that sin. But the beautiful thing about Romans 6.23 that talks about the wages of sin is death or spiritual separation from God for all eternity. The beautiful fact is that all theologians agree that the last part is the most beautiful part of that verse because it says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Our good looks, I say it all the time, our good looks, our efforts, our service, or whatever else you want to do, fill in the blank, are not going to be able to pay for the debt that we owe. The only one, the only remedy is Jesus Christ. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith. It's not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. So back to the message. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the choice is clear. They either obey the king and live, or they obey God and take the risk of possibly dying. I put in my notes, and I know this is a hard thought. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, obey the king, worship the golden image, or die. There's coming a time, I'm afraid, in this country. Are you ready? I know, it's like Sunday. Pastor, don't, don't share bad news. It's not bad news. The good news is that Jesus is going to go with me either way. But it may come a time, and I'm being, I'm being very serious. There may come a time where we have to make the choice like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You either bow down to the whatever it is. The golden image of the United States. The golden image of this leader the golden image of this, that, or the other, or die. It's a very serious thing. And to think that these were just teenage boys. These were just teenage young men who were willing to stand up for what was right. They were men of conviction. Look at verse number 7 and following. Notice in chapter 3 it says, Therefore at the time when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, and all kinds of music, watch it, it says, all the people, the nations, and all the languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So everybody's doing it. And so here's the danger. When everybody does it, it just seems really like pretty easy. Everybody's doing it, so if, if I just fall down and worship, nobody will notice. I saw this meme on social media. It was, it was literally almost like... Somebody put it out there for me. It was a golden image and it had something all around it. And everybody around was bowed down worshiping it. And then it had this little caption behind three guys and it said Christians. And they were standing. See, when you don't go along with the crowd, you're going to stick out. You know, like the sore thumb. You're going to stick out. And so this is what we find. Keep reading. Look at verse number 8. Wherefore at the time certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. Remember I said everybody's, there's always somebody watching. And so notice what happens. They go and tell the king. Verse number 9. They spake and said unto King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou, O king, hast made a decree. Every man shall hear the sound. And uh, once they hear the sound of the music, they're supposed to fall down and worship the golden image. Look at verse number 11. And whoso falleth down not 
and worship not that they should be cast in the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And king, just by the way, in case you haven't heard, there are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee, nor served thy gods, nor worshiped the golden image which thou hast set up. That phrase there where it says they have not regarded thee, they're basically telling Nebuchadnezzar, they don't respect you. They don't honor you, they don't respect you, and they're not listening to you. This is what they're telling the king. Look at verse 13. Then Nebuchadnezzar, uh uh-oh, he's angry. In his rage and fury, he commands them to bring the boys before him. And so here they come. Verse 14, Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true? See, he has a little bit of affinity for these boys. He says, Is it true? Are these guys lying? Are you, not, are you not doing what you're supposed to do? He says, is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do you not serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? I mean, come on, guys. I brought you in. Yes, you're slaves, but I brought you in. I put you in my program. I, I, I allowed you to eat your vegetable and water diet. I allowed you to do this. Daniel, he interpreted the dream, and so I let Daniel put you in positions of authority. I mean... Is it true that you're not going to recognize me? You don't respect me? You're not doing what I'm asking you to do? This is what he's saying. Look at verse 15. (laughs) He says, but now if you be ready at that time when you hear the sound of the cornet and all the music, if you fall down and worship the image which I've made, he says, well, he says, but if you worship not, you should be cast the same hour in the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And notice what he says in verse number 15. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? In other words, your God is no match for me. I'm in charge and you guys better bow down and you better start doing it right now. Oh, how quickly we forget Battlefield Baptist Church. I remember after 9-11, everybody, even people who only go to church, or worship on two days a year, made the pilgrimage to houses of worship all over this country. We need God. We need God. You remember in Daniel chapter 2? In Daniel chapter 2, after Daniel interprets the dream, Nebuchadnezzar not only promotes him, but look at verse 47. In verse 47, the king answered unto Daniel and said, Of a truth it is that your, that your God, talking to Daniel, is a God of gods, little g. In other words, Daniel, your God, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, your God is bigger than all gods. And yet here we have him giving a choice, a second chance, uh, excuse me, to these boys. But at the end of verse 15, he's obviously forgotten what he said because he said, who is the God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Look at verse 16 and 17. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said uh, to the king, hey, we're not careful to answer you in this matter. In other words, king, we don't need a second chance. We don't need your second chance. We're not careful to answer you. Look at verse 17. If it be so, our God whom we serve, there it is, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. So so they immediately tell him, hey, listen, our God is big enough to do it. You may not think he's big enough, but he's big enough to deliver us even from your fiery furnace. But look at verse 18, because here's where the critics come into this story. In verse number 18, notice the Bible says, but if not... But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. So some people actually believe that verse number 18 is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego showing a little bit of doubt. But I disagree. I disagree. They didn't, it wasn't a matter of whether they believed if God could deliver them. It was a matter of them coming to grips with whether God would deliver them or not. You see, they didn't know if it was God's will that he would deliver them from the fiery furnace. But they knew one thing. Whether he delivered them from that fiery furnace, whether he delivered them uh, from the situation that they were in, it didn't matter because one way or another, they knew that they were going to be delivered. Can I tell you? 
we have some people here who have family members who are dealing with serious, serious illnesses. I already asked you to pray for the Witkowski family. And we're praying that God would work a miracle in her life and the liver function would begin to, to do what it's supposed to do and that God would restore her health. But, but can I tell you this? And you guys know from experience that's not always the case. Sometimes, Natalie working in with the children, you know that's not always the case. Sometimes, God's will is that we go through that fire. And these boys understood that. They understood. They knew for sure that no matter what, one way or another, that God was going to deliver them from Nebuchadnezzar's hand. And so, folks, God's power is never in doubt. Even when you and I don't understand what he's doing, we can be assured. It's like the song, even when we don't see you working, even when we don't know whether you're working or not, God is working. He's always working. He is the way maker, the promise keeper, the miracle worker, and on and on. And this is what they knew. Look at verse number 19. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, so he gets really mad. And not only does he get mad, but when he gets mad, his face changes. Look, it says, in the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So what I take that to mean is that, remember, when he gives them a second chance, it's almost like he's pleading with them. He's like, please. I don't want to throw you in the fiery furnace. If you'll just bow down and, and worship the golden image, I've already made the decree. I can't go back on the decree. And since you work for me, you have to do it. But when they tell him, we're not going to do it, it says the change, his face begins to change. He's full of fury. And so he says this. It says he spake and he commanded that they should heat the furnace. Watch it. Seven times more than it was wont to be heated. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the furnace. And these men were bound in their coats and hosen and their hats and all their other garments and were cast in the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Look at verse 22. Therefore, because the king's commandment was so urgent and the furnace was so exceedingly hot, the flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You see what just happened? His own men die throwing them into the furnace because of his anger and his rage and because the furnace is so much hotter, they actually die. But look at verse 23. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound in the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonied. I love that word, astonied. In other words, he was astonished at what he saw. And he rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, Hey, guys, did not we cast? Did not we cast three men bound in the midst of the burning fiery furnace? And they answered and said unto the king, True, O king. And he answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like unto the Son of God. God may not have protected these boys from the fire, but I can tell you he was protecting them while they were in the fire. Amen. Amen. You ever been in the fire? I've been in the fire a few times in my life. There have been a couple of times that I don't even think Critta thought I was coming out of the fire. She said, ah, old boy did it now. He's in the fire. Went down there and caught this, went over to this country and caught that, and come back sick, and he's in the hospital again. Listen, my God is still in the miracle working business. He's got a plan and a purpose, and even I can't afford it. <laughs> Though I've tried on occasion. And the truth of the matter is we may not always be protected from the difficulties of life. But we can be confident. We can be assured. We can be confident. We can be assured that he will protect us in and through any storm that we face today, tomorrow, or the next day. Remember, God told Joshua, I'll be with you wherever you go. The book of Hebrews says he'll never leave us nor forsake us. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. What a comfort to know that although we go through some terrible things in this life, that we can be assured that our Lord will see us through it all. Hmm. 
You remember when Jesus sent the disciples across the Sea of Galilee and a storm rose up? He said, go on over, I'll meet you on the other side. <laughs> you think he knew there, there was a storm getting ready to brew? He knew the storm was there. And he knows those storms come up in our lives as well. You see, our God is bigger than our circumstances, our struggles, or our problems. And we can trust him each and every step of the way, just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Look at verse 26. i got to wrap it up. And Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning, fiery furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants, there it is. Here's the key to our title. Ye servants of the Most High God. He says, come forth and come hither. And so we see his attitude begin to change. He goes from verse 15. He goes from saying one thing in verse 15 to seeing another thing here in verse 25. See, he says in verse 15, who's the God that's going to save you or deliver you from my hand? But then in verse number 25, he says, hold on. I look in there and it looks like I see the Son of God. Who do you think revealed to him that Jesus was in the fire? This worshiper of false gods gets a dose of the one true God. And he sees Jesus in the fire. And he comes to the realization, I've made a boo-boo. Look at verse 26. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the last part of it, they came forth from the midst of the fire. Verse 27, and the prince's governors, captains, and the king's counselors being gathered together, they saw these men upon whom the body, uh, the fire had no power, nor was the hair of their head even singed. Neither were their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had passed on them. That right there, just that last part's a miracle. You ever been around a campfire? You might make s'mores or roast some marshmallows. You, you got to take off all your clothes when you're done unless you just like smelling like smoke. It says they didn't even smell like smoke. Verse 28, then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed, watch it, blessed be the who? Blessed be who? God. Of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who had set his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. The decree had been to bow down and worship or die, and yet because of their faithfulness, because of their courage, and because of God's power working in their lives, these three Hebrew boys, along with Daniel, I would suggest, became superheroes. Not because they were great, because they were servants of the Most High God, who is great. After seeing and experiencing the results of faith for himself, Nebuchadnezzar sets out another decree. Remember, he made a command to worship the golden image. But look at verse number uh, 29. Therefore, he says, I make a decree <laughs> that every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, not going to throw you in the fire. But if you speak amiss of their God, I got a new plan. What does he say? They shall be cut into pieces and their houses shall be made a dung hill because there is no, watch it, there is no, there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. That's our God. The miracle worker. The promise keeper, the way maker, the light in the darkness. That's our God. There is no other God that can deliver after this sort. And so you see Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, a.k.a. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they are all faithful servants of the Most High God. And here's the lesson. Here it is, two thoughts. And you say, we ain't even got to the points because I'm going to give them to you rapid fire. Here it is. They did not compromise. Can I encourage you, young person? Don't be a compromiser. Sir, whether you're 65, 75, 55, 45, 35, 25, 50, I don't care how old you are, sir, don't be a compromiser. Ma'am, don't be a compromiser. Stand up for Jesus, you soldier of the cross. Lift forth his royal, his highest banner, right? His royal banner. It must not suffer loss. Listen, do not compromise, young person. You're going to go to college. I got news for you. Not every college is a loving environment that wants to cultivate your relationship with Jesus. Believe me, I know this. 
And be careful, those of you who are going to Bible colleges. Because not every Bible college is wanting to cultivate your relationship with Jesus. Some of those Bible colleges are off in all kind of crazy stuff. And so be careful who and what you listen to. I want to encourage you to listen. Don't compromise on the Word of God. It's true. If some puffed head person gets up and tells you this is not truth, you, you just turn, let it go in. Take the hearing aid out. That's what I do. You start talking a bunch of junk, I'll just pull out my hearing aids. I ain't got time for it. Life's too short. Don't be a compromiser. Don't be a compromiser, graduates. And then here's another lesson that these boys taught me. And it started all the way back in, verse, in chapter 1. Do not conform to this world. This world will lead you down a, a dead-end street and leave you starving and left for dead. They'll throw you over in the side ditch. They'll use you. They'll abuse you. They'll take every ounce of your effort and your, uh, and your strength, and they will leave you for nothing. But I got news for you. There's one who will never leave you, and his name is Jesus. And if you don't know him, you're doing life on your own. You got to know him. You got to have a relationship with him. And you know what the result was? The result of these superheroes, so to speak, was God's glory. The result was that God was glorified. He gets the glory because at the end of the day, the king says, hey, listen, if you say anything against their God, there's no other God that can deliver after this sort. And if you speak anything against their God, then guess what? Here's what's going to happen. No more fire. Turn the fire off. You're going to be cut up into pieces. We're going to make sausage with you. That's crazy. Your house is going to be left as a dunghill. Nebuchadnezzar rightly said, there's no other God that can deliver after the sort. Are we compromising our faith, church? See, it starts with little things. Just a little slide. And then the next thing you know, we're asking ourselves, what is a woman? It's just a little slide. We forgot that they're not birthing persons, they're moms. It's just a little slide. Oh, I'm just trying to be nice, Pastor. I'm nice too, ask my wife. I'm nice. But we either believe God or we don't. So don't be a compromiser, don't conform. And here's the last thing. And I can't help you on this. Only you can help yourself. But the gift has already been given. All you have to do is receive it. If you don't know Jesus and you're doing this thing called life on your own, I beg you right now, right now where you're at, sitting, watching on the, online, whatever you're doing, stop what you're doing right now and recognize this, that God loves you so much that he proved it by sending his son Jesus who loves you so much who proved it by dying for your sin. If you have never called upon the name of the Lord and asked him to forgive you, see, I can't pay my own sin debt. It doesn't work that way. But if you've never asked the Lord to forgive you and to come into your heart and to save you and to begin to change you from the inside out, I'm begging you right now where you're at, don't walk out of this room without Jesus. It's the most important decision you'll ever make. And so with that, I close. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. We know that it's been a different service this morning. But Lord, I pray that you have been honored and glorified by our songs and praise and praise and worship. And God, I pray that you have been honored and glorified through the teaching and preaching of your word. God, help us to be strong. God, give us wisdom. Your word tells us that if we lack wisdom, we can ask of you. But if we ask for that wisdom, we have to come to you asking for that wisdom in faith. And so, God, I pray that men and women and young people right now would call out upon the name of the Lord and ask for wisdom. God, I pray that if there's somebody in this room that has never trusted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, that today would be the day that they would give up doing things their own way, that they would give up their own plans. And that they would recognize that your word tells us that you have a plan and you have a purpose. 
and that your word recognizes and tells us and assures us that you'll be with us wherever we go and that your word tells us and assures us that you have a future for us. God, I pray that people will make decisions today based on the authority of your word and your love for them. God, this world is seeking to get us off track. May we all, may we all give our lives completely to you. May we live for you. May we ultimately bring you the glory and the honor that you so richly deserve. God, and we'll give you the praise. And we'll give you the glory because as Nebuchadnezzar, as the theologian known as Nebuchadnezzar once said, we know that there is no other God. There is no other God that can deliver after that sort. And so, Lord, we take comfort in knowing that you are that God, that you are the one that makes a way when there seems to be no way. We know that you're the one that keeps your promises. We know that you're the one that is in control of everything. And so, Lord, I ask that you would be with us during this time of invitation, that we would do business with you while you are near. And we'll give you the praise and the honor and the glory for it. We pray this in the precious name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen and amen.